Okay, so in this video I'm going to go through x-rays. Uh, and what we're looking for uh, is to understand how x-rays are produced and used uh, in a medical context. So, for your A-level, you need to be able to describe how x-rays are produced and how they are used to form images. Um, and you should be able to link x-rays to some of the particle physics that you've already studied. Um, you might also, in this video, start to think about methods of improving x-ray images, uh, but that isn't necessarily um, essential for this particular video. So let's start off by thinking about what actually are x-rays. Uh, if you think back to the physics that you've studied in the past, um, you should know that uh, the electromagnetic spectrum starts over here with radio waves at the longest wavelength, and as the, rate, as the wavelength decreases and the frequency increases, we get into the microwave band, then the infrared, then the visible light section that we all uh, that we can perceive with our eyes, then ultraviolet, and finally we end up at X-rays. So X-rays are the second highest band of radiation, um, just uh, before we reach the gamma rays. <coughs> Uh, in order to use a medical x-ray, um, we've obviously got to produce them. One of the things that you need to know for your exam is the system that we use to produce them. Um, so it's uh, relatively unchanged since it was first designed. Uh, basically what we have is a uh, low voltage uh, cathode at one end. So over here we have this connected to a low voltage supply. Now this is a cathode, so cathode means uh, that this is going to be a negative end. Um, so we're going to get lots of uh, electrons being uh, boiled off here, if that is the uh, term that you often see. Um, and if you remember back from when we were thinking about electron guns, this is by fermionic in emission. Uh, and then in the same way that you learned about electron guns, these electrons go travelling uh, through a vacuum tube and they hit a metal target. Now what they do when they hit the metal target is they slow down very, very quickly. Um, and it's just a kind of rule of physics that when electrons slow down very quickly, um, they emit photons. So this is a, a graph of the type of x-rays that are produced. So you can see that as we change the accelerating voltage, um, we can shift this graph up or down. So a uh, higher voltage um, increases uh, the curve that we would see along this line. Um, this process is going to produce a lot of heat um, on, the, on the anode. Um, so one of the things that the anode does is it actually spins round, uh, and the reason that it spins is that uh, where the electrons are hitting one region will become really, 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 really hot, and then as it spins, uh, that'll produce a new target for the electrons uh, to hit, so uh, it's not all bombarding one area and getting one area really, really hot all the time. Um, the other thing is you might see some oil or sometimes water um, will surround uh, the, um, the, the outside of the glass envelope um, and that's used again to help with uh, heat transfer because obviously water is a better conductor of heat. Um, it is obviously important that we have a vacuum inside. Uh, if we have a vacuum then the electrons wouldn't be able to move through it. So thinking back to our uh, emission spectrum, um, there's a couple of things that you need to know about. Um, first thing is that we have uh, in both of them uh, this sort of fairly continuous, uh, fairly boring region. Uh, it's sometimes called a hump. Um, and this is an area called the breaking radiation. Um, and that's caused specifically by the fact that when electrons slow down, they emit radiation. So you can think of it something like this. There's my E minus, and it's traveling with big velocity, um, when it goes down to being with a small velocity, um, you can think of an a photon being emitted. But what's causing these characteristic uh, peaks? Well, 
Um, these are known as characteristic radiation. Um, and characteristic radiation um, is basically caused by the energy levels that you know about in uh, all matter. So if you think about um, the kind of energy levels that we tend to have, it looks something like this. Um, and we have uh, the ground state down at the bottom here. Um, and what can happen is some of these electrons, when they collide with the material, is they can promote an electron up into an excited state. And then as you know, the electron can then drop back down to a lower energy state. And when it does that, it emits a photon. So these particular bands that you see here, um, they're associated with uh, particular energy drops where, or energy gaps, where an electron comes in. So here's my electron. It comes in, it hits the, uh, another electron, it promotes that electron up to a higher energy level, and then later it drops back down and it emits a photon um, at the same time. Now, one of the things that you might be asked to do is, what is the frequency of these emitted electrons, or these emitted photons? Um, or, importantly, what's the maximum frequency that you can get? So there's two things that you can think about here. If we go back to our uh, device here, this is a standard electron gun. And one of the things you should remember is that for a standard electron gun, um, the maximum energy, the maximum kinetic energy of the electron is EV. So it's the charge on the electron multiplied by the voltage. Uh, the voltage on the anode, by the way, um, is anything up to uh, about 120 kilovolts. Um, or it could be as low as 60 kilovolts. So I can say that the kinetic energy of my incoming photons is EV. Now, what we can say is that the maximum kinetic energy, which sorry, the maximum photon energy, well, that will occur when all of the kinetic energy here is transferred into a photon. So when that happens, we know that the uh, we know that the standard equation is that the energy of a photon is equal to Planck's constant times its frequency. We can equate those two, so we can say that EV will equal to HF. Therefore, the maximum frequency will be EV over F. And that lets us find the maximum uh, energy that a particular X-ray will have. Um, and as you can see, therefore, the frequency is dependent on the uh, voltage. Oops, just noticed I made a mistake there, so let's just rewrite that equation. Sorry, that should be over H, obviously. Um, so obviously E and H are constants, so the frequency of the emitted uh, X-rays is going to depend solely on the voltage of the anode. So one of the important things that we can do in medical physics is control the hardness and the intensity of our X-rays. Uh, so hardness uh, is referred to as the frequency of the X-rays. So if you think back to our electromagnetic spectrum, uh, these are hard X-rays. So they're at the higher frequency end, while these are called soft X-rays. Now, generally speaking, hard is good. We prefer harder. Uh, the reason is that harder X-rays uh, pass through tissue more easily. And that's important because the soft x-rays would be blocked by tissue. So first of all, we wouldn't get any images, so they're a bit rubbish. 
Um, but secondly, we're going to be increasing the patient's radiation dose. So if the x-rays can pass through the patient without interacting with them, that's a better thing. Um, the intensity is also important, um, because if we have too many x-rays, then again, we're going to be increasing the dose of radiation that the patient gets. Uh, but if we don't have enough, then we won't get an image. So you've got to control both these things. Um, so it's pretty simple to do that. What we can do is we can adjust the voltage at the cathode. Um, the cathode, if you think about it, that's going to be the heating effect. So more heating will give us more electrons. And as the, it's these electrons crashing into here that produces the x-rays, therefore we'll get more x-rays. Um, so generally, if we want to increase the intensity, then we increase the cathode voltage. That gives us more heating, that gives us more electrons, and we get out more x-rays. If you want to control the intensity, well, let's think back to the equation that we came up with earlier. We said that the frequency maximum, the max frequency, will be equal to EV over F, where V is the accelerating voltage accelerating or anode voltage. So what we're going to need to do um, is if we want more intense x-rays, sorry, if we want harder x-rays, um, then the hardness will be affected by the anode. So bigger voltage will equal a bigger frequency. Um, so just to summarize, the anode controls the hardness, or the anode voltage controls the hardness, and the cathode voltage controls the intensity. So let's think about how an x-ray is actually formed. Uh, what you can see here is this poor unfortunate chap has had rather a lot of objects embedded in his skull. So he's not having a very good day. Um, but let's find out, let's see if we can work out why he's not having a very good day. Um, the way that an x-ray works is it's blocked by bone. So you, what you're seeing here is a photographic image. Now, um, up until about even as short as 10 years ago, pretty much all x-rays were done on photographic film. Um, but now they tend to be done by computer, but the principle is exactly the same. Um, what we have is, just as you saw before, we've got our x-ray tube, and we have electrons coming down here, they crash into the anode, um, all sorts of interesting physics happens, and we get x-rays being produced. Those x-rays come through a window, um, and then they go through the person's hand, or whatever part of the body you are particularly interested in. So you can think of the electrons as traveling through space like this, and then hitting a photographic film. And what we see is that where there are more electrons more um, x-rays, the film comes out darker, and where there are fewer x-rays, the film comes out lighter. And if you think about what you know about phot photography, that kind of makes sense. In a black and white film, um, we would see blackness where there's been lots of light hitting it because it uh, breaks down the chemicals in the film. Um, so how do we see contrast? Well, uh, let's take our skeleton here. Um, if we look at the neck, then x-rays can pass relatively freely through there. So we're going to see quite a lot of x-rays arriving. However, if we take something that's a bit more bony, like the pelvis, uh, some of the electrons, some of the um, x-rays will travel, will pass through, but a lot more of them are going to get absorbed. So what we see is a lighter area where lots of x-rays have got through, where it's less dense. But where more x-rays, sorry, where fewer x-rays get through, um, it appears darker because the tissue and the stuff it's had to go through is more dense, so it's absorbed more of the x-rays. Um, so you might be thinking at this point, well, is there any ma anything mathematical that we can do for intensity? Of course we can. Um, there's an equation for it, as there always is. Intensity is equal to power divided by area. Um, so the power is the energy 
uh, per unit second of the x-rays, so that will be in watts, and the area is obviously going to be in meters, sorry, meters squared. Um, so intensity has the units of watts per meter squared. Um, now what we see with x-rays is that if they're traveling through air, their intensity doesn't really drop off because what we try to do um, is keep the x-rays in a nice focused beam. So in air, the x-rays tend to follow uh, a fairly straight line. However, once they enter, oops, excuse me. However, once they enter into tissue or bone, or the, we'll just say the body, what we see is that that intensity starts to drop off with a curve. Excuse my little uh, drop there, that was a bit of dust on my screen. Um, so it might do this uh, in flesh, lovely word, or it might drop off more quickly through bone. Now, you'll be glad to know that you don't have to do all the maths of this, um, but what we're seeing is a graph of exponential decay. No, let's not use yellow, that's horrible to see. We're seeing a graph of exponential decay. And what you should be starting to find out from any, from all of the capacitor stuff you've done um, and from the radioactivity stuff that you might have already started, whenever we have exponential decay, we're going to have a horrible equation with E in it. But fortunately, these equations all follow exactly the same pattern. So for radiation, it follows the equation that the intensity of the radiation is equal to some initial intensity, which we're going to call I0, multiplied by e to the negative, then a constant, and then the distance that it's travelled. And if you think about it, there's a lot of analogues here. Um, if you think about radiation decay, then instead of x, we could have t, um, and instead of intensity, we could have activity. Um, if you think about capacitors, we'd also have T there, and we could have voltage there. And they're always the same form of the equation. Um, so this is exactly the same form again. And those of you studying maths, you might look at uh, some of the reasons for why E always crops up. And it is really fascinating. I recommend that you have a look. Um, however, we're not here to talk about that, so let's talk about this equation instead. So we have I, which is the measured intensity. We have I0, which is the initial intensity. So for our patient, it would be the intensity before it hits their body. We have X, which is the depth in the tissue. And we have this factor mu. And we call mu the attenuation coefficient. Sometimes you might also see it uh, referred to as the absorption coefficient. Um, so what you should be able to see from this equation is that flesh has a relatively low attenuation coefficient, whereas bone has a relatively high attenuation coefficient. And then there's this, this last thing you need to know about, which is half thickness. It's an I loss to half life, um, and it is the distance required to reduce the transmitted intensity of an X ray at a particular frequency to half its original value. So, again, if you look at this equation, this, sorry, this graph, this thickness here, where it's dropped by half, would be the half thickness. And it follows the same rules as everything else. Um, each time that the intensity halves, the half thickness would increase by one. So that covers uh, everything that you need to know about the basics of how radiation works. I hope you found it useful. Um, if you do have any questions, then you can put some comments in at the end of this video, or you can talk to me in class.